shapes how we feel of that monster. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to weigh in on that, maybe? Yeah, I think they can also be uh, framing devices for the characters themselves. I mean, sort of like the dark mirror of the character, ways to re-examine certain social issues. But that are, if you can divorce a social issue from humanity and put it in a strange situation, then you can review it with less baggage. So if you have, um, well, you don't have an internal baggage coming into it. So if you have a monster that is sort of representative of some issue that you are trying to address with your storytelling, um, it makes it easier to get the message across to the readers sometimes. And there's also um, that whole, you know, the, you hunts the monster runs the risk of becoming the monster situation, and it's always kind of interesting when you have a protagonist that you empathize with and care about, and you don't want them to see that we become that thing that they are chasing down. So, Dave. I'd like to go back to your fun. You'd like to go I back would to like to go back to fun monsters. You'd like to go back to fun monsters. So when when does a monster just not work? Oh, when does it not work? Well, yeah. that's when we're going back to fun. What well, do you want to talk about? Talk about fun. Oh, okay. Go ahead. When does a monster not work? I think there are a whole host of monsters that can get bored by very quickly. One, if it's not scary enough. Right. If it doesn't have enough energy, if it's mm -hmm. not propelling the plot forward. I feel like we all know the basic stuff, but it has to not just you kind of can't do random encounters, can you? Where like you just I was walking down the forest. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. And, but there's a manticore for some reason. Oops. I'm like, oops. oops. Now I now I got spiked. Yeah. And now I got story done. Story done. Or you yeah. know, just like it doesn't it doesn't really do anything except it's like it's the equivalent of a jump scare, isn't it? Like you're not really scared that the the hero was put in danger, you're scared with you it's like, oh, well that was briefly interesting. But you know, you have shows like Supernatural that have been doing it for what, like a decade now? Yeah. And mind you, I've been watching it from the beginning, mm -hmm. but which is really that amazing. That Dean. Right? Oh. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, we've been talking about sexy monsters all night, so that's fair game. Sammy? Sammy? <laughs> I get that so many. I've never seen the show, and it just it annoys the hell out of me. I don't get it. Okay. That's how he says his brother's name. Yes, oh. he does. And Sammy? Like that. In the car. Yeah. It's, it's and then they cry. Yeah. Like they it cry. out, no beer. Yeah. Then yeah. But they on, die. On the Impala. But they don't talk. They just have silence, and it's a beautiful, manly, brotherly silence. Tearing a little bit. I tear every time. So perhaps so the real monster is society's expectations of men. <laughs> why we are supposed to not cry. Yep. There, but drink beer. There we go. There we go. I can cry right now. Can <laughs> 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 you cry on cue? You, is it like, is it, is it pretty <laughs> 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 no, it's ugly car. I gotta do, look at me. I'm starting at a baseline of ugly. I mean, come on. So did you have something you wanted to add about fun I did, monsters? I did, because I thought about it. Please go on. And your buddy Will. Will is my editor. His and buddy. He's my buddy. He just took part in a book called Dragon Lords Fool's Gold. And the premise is basically that dragons are kind of the rulers of this kingdom. As they should be. As they should be, you know, which I love the idea of. And it's kind of like an Ocean's Eleven with dragons, which I like because the dragons, because they're like, you know. Wait, like, just a uh, gosh darn. <laughs> right? I'm telling you, it's like a dragon heist. So, like, there's like this. Are one they one. heisting from dragons there's or are the dragons doing, dragons doing the heist? Gold. Okay, that's right. So, the dragon yeah, wants all that. the gold. Oh, that's great. That's and so, fantastic. Like, that's not yeah, bad. Right? That's not bad. So, I thought that was like a really fun way of doing dragons and doing it differently and having a monster. But I have to tell you, there was a part, and this is probably way too much detail for you guys. But the there's little goblins, like I guess they're very tiny. Yeah. And the guy grabs it and he squishes it, and you hear like a squish of the goblins. And that was literally my favorite part. And every time we'll present it in the conference, I would literally make squishing sounds. <laughs> <laughs> he really appreciated that. That's, that's, he did. that's outstanding. Yeah. Do we? Do, uh, there's not. How recently was this acquired? Because yeah, I want to read it. Dude, this is going to be huge. Yeah. No, I would love the to cover read it. is awesome. I, I, I it's our first dragon cover. Alone. Dragon yeah. Yeah. That's We've never had a dragon cool. on our cover, so this is literally Ridiculous. the first orbit cover of dragon. I should do a fucking poster on it. Yeah. You know there's a whole Reddit thread? On dragon posters? On dragons fucking cars. No shit. <laughs> They're awesome. Yeah. Actually, I have a running joke on Twitter. I'm like, do you like dragons? You like muscle cars. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say I never did anything for you, Link. 
<laughs> so perhaps the real monster <laughs> is Dragon's fucking car. Look it up. Google it, y'all. No, it's don't. Fucking ridiculously awesome. We have 15 minutes. We're going to use this time wisely. Please, someone have a better question. Yes. So one of the things I think that makes characters interesting is having ulterior motives and lying and having an agenda, that type of thing. And sometimes when you have monsters that are not smart, it makes it difficult to do that type of, of level of character building. So monsters with character that allows them to, you know, I'm thinking of something like a science fiction thing where the, the alien now has the intelligence to be able to lie to people. So is that you know something that would make monsters more interesting and, and you know to be intelligent? Be intelligent. Um, well, in uh, the book I was talking about earlier, *Blind Sight* by Peter Watts, they have basically brought back vampires, and they're not your sparkly, fuzzy yeah. vampires. They're basically supercomputers with fangs, and they're hunters, and they are very much hunters, and they lie <laughs> a lot. I like that, by the way. That that that. When you mentioned that, that's like my, if somebody asks, like, what's your, what, that's always been my thing, like, with aliens, especially if you write science fiction, it's like, oh, you, you come up with an original alien that's not like Star Trek, a uh, humanoid with a, with a brow ridge, whatever, and, and, like, that comes to mind when somebody asks, what's the most alien alien that you've read about? Uh, it's Peter Watts' blind side, because these aliens are alien, they, they don't look like us, they don't think like us, they don't act like us, they're just completely like alien in the best sense of the word. Have you read the follow-up, Echo Cracks? I have it on my Kindle, I'm like, I'm kind of savoring it, like, you know, when, when people thought Twinkies were going to go out of out of business, and people were hoarding the Twinkies, and you have to, like this last pack of Twinkies, like, I can't open it yet, but, so I'm, I'm, I'm savoring that, but yeah, that the, the space vampire, uh, Joker Sarasti, is like, yeah. scary as shit, that's the it's scary, scary. Yeah, there's no twilight in that. That's the scariest vampire you'll ever read about if you haven't have read that book. Yet. Yeah. You're, you're gonna like Valerie. Okay. I'm That's all yeah. I'll say. <clears throat> well, cool. Uh, any other? Yes, ma'am. One of the narrative theories about um, zombies and vampires and monsters, the human monsters, the vampires and zombies and werewolves come from our fear of disease. And since disease isn't something we fear anymore, it's something we live with. One of the theories is that that's why we've got sexy vampires and ironic zombies and werewolves that we cuddle up to. Um, do you guys think that there are any monsters? What is an ironic zombie? <laughs> <laughs> like you know, the dude who turns into not a zombie. Like he's not he's not he's, he's not eating flesh because he likes it. He's just like oh, oh, right. like, 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 like it yeah. in your brain. You know, it's like yeah. kind of like ironic. It. He's shuffling so, around. In There's head. actually a really good book by S. G. Brown called um, Breathers, and the first line is. Is it necrophilia if you're both dead? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, um, do you guys think that there are any particular traditional monsters that we're still genuinely afraid of? Hmm, that is a good question. It's, that's the real monster. <laughs> it's, it's, the, the, it's the lack of wonder. It's, 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 it's the crown. Uh, <laughs> that's the crown. Um, that's, no, no, go ahead. I, I just, the thing that popped into my head when you said like like the fear of disease, and you can say the monsters tend to morph with whatever the fear of society is, and the, the thing that pops to mind, uh, com comes to mind, you know, the thing, the 70s version of the, the Carpenter version of the thing, or the 80s version, versus they have the 50s version where the thing is basically this giant space character. In the 50s, and I think Steve, Stephen King mentioned that in, in his um, uh, movie, uh, the one that he did with um, the movie critics, book was it Dance Macabre, Dance Macabre yeah. uh, the, the 50s version of the thing is about invasion because that's what people were afraid of you know the communist scare blah 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 McCarthyism mm -hmm. yeah McCarthyism and the 80s version of the thing is completely different it's like things exploding from within the body and the body morphing in these grotesque shapes and that the thing is like the thing is uh, like like a cancer allegory basically uh, in in the movie and it's like the same story it comes from the same sh same short story it's just filtered through Whatever the, the the society of the day, you know, the the, the big fear of the day is, and, 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 and in the eighties and nineties and up to, you know, we were more fear scared of cancer and disease because people around us are dying from terrorism and all that stuff. It's kind of abstract, you know. But cancer, like everybody knows somebody who's, and that's constantly in everybody's back of the head because it can take anybody just like that. So so the the updated version of the thing. Now I haven't seen the the two thousands version of the thing yet. I don't know if, if that was any good, but yeah, the monsters tend to morph with 
with yeah, and zombies are, are definitely totally a disease disease allegory. Hmm. Well, I, I would like to expand upon that a little bit. Like if you look at the if you look at the really in the early mid two thousands the prevalence of zombie movies. Um, you know, you can say like you can say a lot of things like cancer. Like I always thought that zombies were like a manifestation of our fear of cancer because um, they work upon the human body, the human politic, like a cancer. But they also externally, like, sort of almost start resembling like the stylized idea of a tumor. You know, like they look like, right. um, you know, and and vampires obviously can be easily some correlation between like sexual transmitted diseases and you know I mean it's really easy to hang sort of mor morals on, on these guys but zombies really made a resurgence in about 2005 and a lot I've always thought like it's really sort of the marginalization of the middle class that, that sort of um, you know there's a large and growing always portion of America that is being pushed out you know pushed to the side and, and um, devalued and it's sort of like a revenge, like a lot of zombie stuff is sort of a revenge fantasy. Um, I'd say that's totally true because zombie, like at the core of everyone, every, everyone, you know, you ask someone what their zombie revenge plan or their zombie survival plan yeah. is, no one really takes the sensible option and says, I will move somewhere very far away from a population and just live there. Yeah. They always think like, oh, I've got this weapon, I've got this strategy. The idea is, the, the central idea is to kill as many people as possible. Right. And you know, a zombie, the, the, the allure of the zombie fantasy is that you can kill people with impunity. Right. But it's also like, if you look at the structure, it is shit, look, everyone dies, when, but there's an assumption that you're not going to die as, as, a, as the reader. Yeah, it's, it's always... You're going to be the survivor, and suddenly you're the 1%. And so there's all these marginalized motherfuckers, and you've won the lottery. Mm. You, you know, I mean, that's yeah. that's sort of like the sort of built-in sort of thing you have to buy into in a zombie book, and it's really compelling, or a zombie movie or whatever. I mean, yeah, that's like you are the special one. Yeah, is pretty is a very common trope. Being that that sort of basically even more emphasizes that you're not just the special one; you're the only one. So perhaps the real monster <laughs> is socioeconomic. Uh, capitalism. Uh, yes, you, sir. Um, yeah, one thing I was going to say, one of the other things that makes the 80s uh, version of the thing really work is just paranoia. Yeah. Because, which was also prevalent at the time, because you don't know who's the monster or who's not in some of the scariest parts of the movie where they're trying to test and they got people tied up and they're trying to figure out, well, whose blood sample is going to explode and who's just going to go when you put the fire in it. I think that's but, such a great movie. Yeah, but what, what I was going to say is, uh, in terms of, uh, I, mean, I was going to ask you guys about this, in terms of monsters that are still scary from mythology, uh, I've always been fascinated and very creeped out by the notion of fairy changeling, where somebody come creeps into your kid's window at night and leaves this thing behind that looks like your child, sort of acts like your child, but there's something off about it. And as they grow older, and you, know, you start realizing that, you know, wait a minute, where's 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 the dog? Oh my God, what happened to the dog? John, did you see the dog? No, Mom. Crap like that goes on, and slowly you realize there's something dare or terribly wrong with your child, but nobody believes you. You know something's wrong because you've had this child this entire time, and there's a certain point where it's like somebody turned the light out. In your eyes. Well, it's 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 that. I think everyone fears sort of loss of control yeah. of their mental faculties, and that's sort of a very like slow. Uh, am I going mad, or is this really happening to me? I feel like a lot of this sort of gave rise to paranormal romance and urban fantasy, where there's a lot of creatures that seem so far removed from us that like we can't even fathom that this might actually like they, they would ever pose a threat to us. Like if you are some hick living in Greece, ancient Greece, and you know, not much is going on. Yeah, you probably you probably would fear the idea of a hack man kind of bull because you haven't seen the world. They could be out there. But like zombies, we can say like, yeah, maybe there will one day be a disease that turns people into zombies, but the chances of you wandering outside and there's a minotaur and you're like, well, well bless my soul. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> Probably not so much. Wrong. So they wound up being sort of more romanticized, I believe, and sort of put into 
paranormal romance and that sort of thing. Well, they weren't great in serial. Like, if you have a character that is that, that like people are invested in, that's just you know, like what's the Dresden? Oh, Dresden. I, I've never read any of those books, but you know what I'm talking about. Like, in, in a serial format, it's like. You know, there's no overarching sort of character. There's no character arc in the series. It's just like you're you're reading it because you want the same experience each time, which mm -hmm. is just comfort food. So how do we do something new? Oh, we're just going to introduce this new monster. Oh, it's going to be it's going to be a fucking minotaur living in the sewers of you know uh, New York, or it's going to be you know a well, we sexy possessed sex doll, or it's going to be no, whatever. The only thing that can live in the sewers of New York. Half man, half turtle. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone knows that. <laughs> or half rat. What about or half rat? What about alligators? They flush enough of them. There was there was leatherhead, so yeah. yeah. That as well. <laughs> uh, let's face. See. One more question. How do you guys feel about machines as monsters? I think that's a pretty classic, uh, classic trope, and you know we are deeply terrified of machines. Um, Matrix, uh, before the Matrix, uh, there's a there's a great episode of uh, of the Twilight Zone where they like introduce this machine that's thinking, and you know it's the Twilight Zone, so at the end it's the machine has taken their jobs, and the, the final shot is just one of those clunky '50s robots, but he's wandering around like spinning a gold watch and smoking a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> it's the I've ever seen. So we've always, I think, you know. It's probably even more feasible because someone out there right now is working on artificial there's, intelligence. There's this extra layer to it too because with like the supernatural stuff is like the werewolf appears, the vampire appears, so like there's this ancient shit that you can't do anything about that's always been around and interface on you. Yeah, so yeah. But the machine goes nuts and kills starts killing people. This is something that you made. This is like this whole thing like our own hubris coming back to bite us in the ass. And that's, that, that is a very attractive well, rot. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's a very attractive fantasy too because it also feeds into the idea like you are so special. You created something that killed yourself. Well, it's like Frankenstein, but, you know, I would add to the same thing is the singularity. So, you know, that's a, it's a machine, it's a construct. Um, yeah, I mean, it is inherently frightening, just in the sense that if anyone has had kids, it's terrifying. They, they get to a point where they're like, oh shit, they're, they're smarter, they're smarter than you, they're more vital, they are, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, my, my, I have two teenagers, and I, every day I'm like, what have I wrought? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know. Yeah, when um, they were born, did you hold them up and say, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, But, um, you know, uh, I will say this. I just want to throw this out there. As a monster, my favorite machine as monster story is uh, a Fire Upon the Deep. Have you ever read? Or, I mean, it might not be Fire Upon the Deep. A deepness? No, Fire Upon the Deep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, so it's a, just a wonder. I don't know if you've ever read a classic sci-fi Hugo winner. It is it, the premise is the closer you are to the galactic core, the slower your machines work, and I think it has something to do with gravity. But the further, like your thinking machines, so the further away you get from the galactic core, the, the more uh, higher levels of artificial intelligence you can have. And so these people go out to the very furthest edges of the galaxy trying to create godlike intelligences. And they actually start doing it. And one of them comes, like, they call it a class two perversion. And just starts fucking everything up. And it's just... Really <laughs> Please continue. They really mess things up significantly. And it's wondrous. It's really good. All right. Well, that's about. Any anyone have any closing thoughts? Megan. I think Sam's the real monster. <laughs> Perhaps the real monster <laughs> is the way we so casually dismiss him. He should have a mask and then he'll turn around. <laughs> yeah. That would have been a good twist. Robert would have done that. Uh, Davey, any closing thoughts? Yeah. Monsters are cool. Monsters are freaking sweet. The monster freaking sweet brings Marco loose. Uh, thank you for watching, YouTube. Sorry, everything got a little out of hand. <laughs> you know, you, you know what you were getting into, or maybe you didn't.
Maybe you looked up Sexy Murder Doll and wound up here. So thank you for tuning in. I'm Sam Sykes. And perhaps the real monster is you. Thank you for coming.